we have something even better than the Super Bowl this morning. We have Jesus, we have the Word of God, and we have the truths that transform hearts and minds and souls and that lead us to the good life. And so if you're in uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, we've been going through a series entitled The Good Life. Uh, and, uh, and it's something that we all want. It's something that all humanity wants, that search for happiness, that search for joy and the blessing of God on our lives. We all want it. Uh, in fact, author, uh, best-selling author Gretchen Rubin uh, claims to have found it. And uh, she wrote a book uh, that became a project called The Happiness Project. Uh, the Happiness Project. And it was one rainy afternoon while she was riding a city bus that Gretchen Rubin asked herself, um, what do I want from life anyway? And, uh, and her answer was, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. And yet she had spent no time really in her life thinking about happiness. And so in a flash, she decided to dedicate an entire year to a happiness project. And the result is the book that came out and now the podcast as well as an award-winning app, all leading people to happiness. And uh, Gretchen Rubin says, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, she explains, so there's no right way or best way, and we have to choose the way that works for you. And so she uh, actually says, uh, gives a few steps on how to begin. You want to find out how to begin your happiness journey today, according to uh, Gretchen Rubin? Uh, you should first write your own happiness manifesto. Describe what happiness looks like for you. And once you've got that down, then begin, uh, begin to discover your own truths about happiness. She says there's eight of them that she's found specifically and, and discovered herself. And, and then on top of that, she says, write out your own happiness commandments. And she has the 12 commandments. She has more commandments than Jesus had, right? The 12 commandments of happiness. And these are things like be yourself, let it go, act the way you want to feel, and there is only love. Now, I don't know how, uh, how well that's going for her necessarily, but um, uh, I want to applaud the effort that she has. She's going after something that all of our hearts long for, and she's put a lot of effort and intentionality into that. And so you've got to applaud uh, that type of a search, as well as her desire to help others find that as well, um, not only through her podcast and her app, but also her book, Right? But as I was reading it and as I was sensing this description and this pathway to happiness, my heart could not help but, but think there's some things that are just missing here. There's some things just don't connect for me. I mean, when, when we talk about like determining our own truth or writing our own commandments, like, like that's putting ourselves in the place of God. That's a higher elevation than I think I'm willing to go uh, myself and and even beyond that, there was one thing that stuck out more than anything. In all the happiness that she is calling people to and leading people to, she is forgetting about the happiness that is forever happiness. The happiness that doesn't just last in a momentary life, but lasts for eternity. And there's no mention of that from what I could find. Friends, I have good news. I have good news. We don't need an app for it. We don't need an award-winning book for it because, in fact, we have the greatest award-winning book in our hands this morning. And Jesus gives and speaks about the good life and that pathway to true happiness of heart. And he speaks with the authority of divinity. And he speaks with the vindication of the resurrection behind him. And he definitively defines for all people of all time the way to find happiness, the way to experience the good life in our lives, the way that you can find today as you turn to him this morning. And we read it and see it in the Beatitudes. Jesus began speaking of these things in Matthew chapter 5. Follow along with me starting at verse 3. Jesus said, blessed or happy, or fortunate and favored of God to receive the blessings of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that verse, verse 8 there, is our passage for this morning. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. How does the good life come? Where does it come from? It comes to the pure in heart. And we're going to begin with that point here this morning. Uh, Point number one, the good life comes to the pure in heart. Just as Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And it is the pure in heart, those whose hearts are pure before the Lord, who actually get to see him, get to witness him, and and experience the Lord and his presence in their lives. They even get to enjoy the glory of his presence. Back in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. Man, that good life is experienced in the presence of the Lord and before him as we see him. In fact, in, uh, uh, in uh, Psalm 16, 11, it says this, you make known to me the path of life. And don't just think of life as like, I can breathe in life. Uh, life or, or, or even that sense of like, how to live my life. But this is the path of life. This is the path of goodness and blessedness and the abundant life. You make known to me that path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David said, do you want to see supreme beauty? Do you want to behold and the extreme ecstasies of life? Do you want to experience all the good that, that life has to offer? It is found in the Lord. And it's found in his presence. The beauty, the ecstasy, the enduring hope, and the eternal love. Those things are found in the Lord. But it was also David in Psalm 24, a few chapters later, who would say, Who actually gets this great blessing? Who is the one who gets the blessing to see God, to behold God, to experience those pleasures and those joys forevermore? And the answer was the pure in heart. Look what he says in Psalm 24, uh, starting in verse 3. He says this, Who shall ascend the hill, hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? David's literally saying, who can go up to the Lord? Who can experience his presence? Who can come before him and see his glory here before all of Israel? Who is the one who can approach the very throne room of God? Who is that one? He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. It is the one who has been sanitized without and the one who has been sanctified within. And the pure in heart, uh, write this down in your notes. The pure in heart are those threefold who are internally converted, morally cleansed, and singularly committed. The pure in heart are the internally converted Friends, uh, for us to experience the purity of heart and a transformation of life, it comes and it flows from that conversion of heart. It doesn't just happen because we have more education in our lives, right? The world likes to solve the problems of the heart of man by just saying, if we only taught them more, if we taught them a better way, if we showed them a better way, then the heart of man would grasp that way and they would learn and be better. And friends, the reality is, is that the scriptures don't teach that at all, right? Uh, to be taught a better way, so especially with a heart that is evil, when I give more information to a prideful and arrogant heart, guess what they become? They become more uh, deceitful, more armed with the ability to use that information to wound others and to seek only their own advantage. Education does not change the heart, uh, but neither does acceptance. The world today wants to tell us that if we only accept people, if people truly could experience that acceptance within their heart, and that we all say, you're okay, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter who you are, if we only accept, then people would experience that purity of heart. It would be changed from the inside. Well, that's not what the scripture says at all. The scriptures don't uh, don't teach that acceptance is the way to transformation, Um, but it also doesn't come through discipline, right? It doesn't come through discipline, right? Uh, You can get uh, very disciplined on the outside. You you send a send a new recruit into the military, and they go through boot camp, and man, they are whipped into shape, and then they are trained. They are broken down. I remember I I came from a military family, and, and and they literally will break you down in the military until you are down to nothing. 
And then they will rebuild you again into a super soldier so that you feel invincible and able to take on the world. It's a, it is a masterful stroke that is, uh, that is masterful not only psychologically but also behaviorally. But friends, the reality is, is behavior or, or uh, behavior modification or, or behavioral discipline uh, only has a limited effect. And, and we can never experience the true change that is necessary in the heart unless it is internally converted. Unless the heart is changed. You can change the behaviors on the outside and the inside still be rotten to the core. And so, friends, for a purity of heart to be found, there needs to be that internal conversion, that internal transformation that can only be found through the Lord. But the pure in heart are also also those who are morally cleansed. Those who are morally cleansed, right? And it's so important that we, that we uh, come against behavioral modification, right? Behavioral modification. Change your behavior. Do something different. Make yourself righteous, right? See, Jesus spent a lot of time giving these commands and talking about these beatitudes, and what he's counteracting is the the spiritual leaders of the day and what they had been showing through their lives and telling through their teachings. And he's talking about the Pharisees going, these guys are people who are very clean on the outside. They look great. In fact, in Matthew 23, he would say, they look like whitewashed tombs, right? And if you go to Israel, you see many whitewashed tombs on the hill uh, outside of Jerusalem, right? And, and, and these tombs look beautiful to see. They are so cleansed. They are so washed. And Jesus is like, you are like those wash, whitewashed tombs. You look amazing on the outside. And then he says, in your heart, it's dead man's bones, right? It is rottenness to the core. And he says, man, you have been focusing on cleansing the outside because they were really good at the law. They were really good at cleaning up, right? And and part of the Old Testament law, uh, if you remember the tabernacle, in there was the basin, right? And the basin had pure water, and it was for ceremonial cleansing. And the Pharisees were so focused, and they were so uh, hyped about the ceremonial cleansing, and we had to stay clean, right? That's where we all get that idea of cleanliness is next to godliness. (gasps) Oh, where did mom get that, right? It was kind of from the Bible, right? She's hearing that cleanliness is next to godliness, and if I want to draw near, I got to be cleansed. Well, they focused all on the outward, and they missed the heart. And friends, that's the reality of every time that we try to change, and we want a pure heart, and we go outward in, and we're trying to change our behaviors. We're trying to tell us to stop that thing without a changed heart, without an inner working of cleansing within. We can never experience the moral purity in our life that will flow out, right? And so, The the scriptures come along and Jesus comes along and he's like, it's not the things you eat, it's not the things you touch, it's not the things going on outside that contaminate you, it's rather the sinful heart within, the, the heart that is immoral before the Lord. That's where that impurity is. And so you need a cleansing from within, a moral cleansing of your life from the inside out. That's the pure in heart but it's also singularly committed. And that's the idea of having uh, no duplicity and no duality, right? There is no duplicity of heart where I'm I'm hypocritical in my life and I'm I'm showing one thing on the outside and, and, and I'm living so differently on the inside, right? And doesn't that happen so often, right? We come to church, we all live here together, and we're like hanging out, we're like, man, these people are great. They love us, they're, they're, they're welcoming, and yet when we get to real life and we get behind the scenes, we go, oh, Pastor Mike is actually a sinner, right? Oh, oh my gosh, DT, he is so nice on the outside, but gosh, well, okay, he's nice on the inside too, but... Everybody else, no, <laughs> no, 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 for all of us, right, there's, there's no duplicity, right, there's no deceitfulness of heart where we are trying to deceive one another, we're trying to put a face or put a story out there, put a perception out there, but also there's no, uh, there's no deception of ourselves in the sense that we are deceiving ourselves about the reality of life, and our hearts are now coming in line with the reality of God as he sees the world. And so there's no duplicity, but there's also no dualism. The purity of heart is one who is singularly devoted to the Lord. A heart that is singularly devoted to him. 
And so there's no competition within the secret heart of our lives. There is no rival throne to the things of God. There is only the Lord himself. And that's the pure in heart. Internally converted, morally cleansed, and singularly committed. And Jesus says, to this person comes the good life. To the pure in heart, they experience the good life. To see God. And that leads us to our second point here this morning. The pure in heart see God today by faith and tomorrow face to face. This is the awesome reality of what Jesus was calling us to. The pure in heart see God today by faith and tomorrow face to face. Now, the wonderful thing and the wonderful reality is for the people who are hearing Jesus and witnessing Jesus, they saw God in the flesh. They got to see him and behold him with their eyes. For us, we have a greater blessing from the Lord because we believe even though we have not seen. Our hearts long for that. But there's a reality that all saints who have lived on the earth have not seen God of creation, the Father himself. But the pure in heart see God today by faith. And tomorrow we will see face to face. You see, as with the Beatitudes, the partial reality that we are living in now will one day become a full experience later. In fact, if you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, the Apostle Paul said this, while speaking about love, it, 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 it speaks of that, uh, that, that now versus then. Verse, uh, verse 12 says, for we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. The Apostle Paul is speaking of that reality going, man, right now we see God and, and we see parts of him. We see, a, uh, we see the Lord through a, through a mirror dimly. Lord, Lord, like we can't see fully. We don't know exactly what's on the other side of eternity. We don't see on the other side to the spirit realm. We only see through this mirror dimly. We have the word of God that's informing us. And then through faith we see and experience things. We see the Lord moving. We see and experience. But then when we are in heaven when we are on the other side of eternity when we stand before the lord we will see in perfection we will see clearly and holy we will behold the glory of god face to face there will be no question one day faith will become sight and that is the hope and the longing for the follower but today the pure in heart can see god today by faith and tomorrow face to face. In fact, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 verse 27, Moses saw God by faith. Hebrews 11 27, it says, by faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses never witnessed God with his own eyes. He could never see and behold God because as we learned in Exodus 33, as he's asking to see the glory of God, uh, God tells him in Exodus 33, no man can see me and live. And why is that? Well, Adam and Eve could see God. They beheld the Lord walking in the cool of the garden. But something happened and that something was sin. And when sin entered the world and, and our hearts were corrupted, we could not behold the holiness and the perfection and the beauty and the glory of God. We could not contain that in our fractured state. No longer could we experience that. And so we cannot behold God in our sinful state and still live. We would be struck dead in a moment. So uh, Moses only got to see the after, after effects of, of his presence passing by. When Moses experienced and had a holy presence uh, encounter with the Lord, do you know what he saw? He saw an invisible God who gave him the, the image of a burning bush and a voice coming from it. He didn't behold God with his own eyes. He saw partially. And he saw God today by faith. By faith, by faith, he saw him who is invisible. And friends, that's the reality for the follower of Jesus. That's the reality for those who are in Christ today, right? That we see him by faith. 
I don't hear the Lord's voice audibly. I've never had that experience. I, I, you know, some throughout history have had that experience. I have not had that experience. But I'll tell you, I, I, I know the Lord's voice when he speaks to my heart. Have you experienced that? Do you know that? Or, or to see the Lord change lives and answer prayers. Or, or, or to, to, to work miracles. Friends, I could tell you about multiple times that the elders have prayed over people over, throughout the years in our church, in the existence of our church, and to see, you know, see the person with stage four cancer be healed, or, or to see the person um, uh, uh, who had, uh, who had, uh, uh, um, I can't remember exactly the, the specific brain function issue that they had, but but to hear them come back and say, you know what? After praying for me, I went to the doctor, had it had it uh, checked out, and it was healed. Like, completely in awe over and over. We've seen miracles like that. In fact, I was, uh, I was doing the, uh, uh, the funeral for uh, Pastor Johnny's dad. Uh, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful honoring time. I think your dad would have been so proud, Pastor Johnny, uh, for that. We had a, a wonderful and intimate time just uh, reminiscing about his dad and just uh, speaking about the goodness of Jesus and his faith in Jesus. But then we went out to Cary, Illinois, and, uh, and we had the committal service, the burial service at the cemetery. And as I was driving in, I was like, oh, this is where my friend was, was buried. I had a friend, his name was Clyde Harrison. And Clyde Harrison, um, man, I knew him uh, 20 plus years ago. And Clyde Harrison went to be with the Lord. He had glioblastoma cancer, brain cancer. It's like a, it is a death sentence once you get it. And, and the Lord used that in his life to bear out a testimony of just his, his grace and mercy uh, for Clyde. But it's interesting, in the early days of our church, Clyde was a uh, wealthy CEO. And uh, he was a wealthy CEO at a different, and he didn't come to our church, but we were friends. And we were, uh, we, you know, he would, he would give me business advice, and I would give him spiritual advice. And so uh, me, as this uh, 20-something-year-old kid, hanging out with this man who is in his 60s, and, and, and I'm telling you, just the conversations that we were able to have was awesome. So fast forward now multiple years, and we're planting a church, and Clyde's was, was like, man, one day, one day the ship is coming in, and, and I want to I wanna help out. Well, I appreciated that, but we went on to plant the church, mostly, mostly without any uh, of Clyde's help, but it was interesting. There was a season in our church's life when we did not think we were going to make it. We did all the calculations. We ran the numbers. We saw what people were giving and believed everybody was faithfully giving, but the numbers just weren't going to add up. We were going to be $40,000 short for the year. So literally, I still remember the, the morning we uh, stood up. Andrew Von Gillen, you can probably remember that morning when we stood up in front of the church and, uh, and we just asked the church. We laid it all out and we said, hey, would you fast with us in prayer? We called the church to fasting and praying and asking that the Lord would show us, show up, and he would show us whether or not we should continue in this work. And you know what happened? I get into the office Tuesday morning, and my assistant comes in. Now, she doesn't normally do this. I don't typically know what, what people are giving, but these were gifts that came in from outside the church. Without asking a single person, without anyone else knowing, she put in front of me a check for $1,000 and a check for $25,000. And that check for $25,000 came from Clyde Harrison. Sowing in a field, so so many years earlier, and the, God, and the God of the universe stirred his heart and said, hey, the Lord put, put this on my heart to give to your church right now. My ship has come in, and, uh, and it's to your blessing. God showed up. God met our need. And I'll tell you, there's stories like that that we all have. And if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, you've got those stories. You've got that journal that's building with all those evidences of seeing the Lord at work, right? And, and, and do we see him physically here today? No, we don't. But we experience the blessing when we come into worship. 
And we sense his presence inhabiting the praises of his people. We sense and know it when we meet with him intimately in our quiet times, opening the word and hearing the ministry of the spirit to our souls. We sense it when our hearts are breaking at a funeral, and yet the presence and comfort of the very presence of the Holy Spirit is there saying, I love you, I have not left you, I am with you, and I will help you through this. We know that and we experience that. And that is a great blessing. And Jesus says, man, that that comes to the pure in heart. To see God today. But but friends, that's only a taste. That's only a, a dim mirror, a dim reflection. The true is coming one day. One day when we stand with Jesus. One day when we leave this life. One day, the reality, Johnny, that your dad knows today. It says, no longer will there be anything accursed. Revelation 22, verse 3. No longer will there be, any, be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Friends, there is coming a day when your faith will become sight. When the veil of eternity will be peeled back, and you will behold the glory of God in face-to-face experience. Because God, our great hero, has redeemed what he created and the intimate fellowship of the garden in Genesis chapter 2 will be restored. And at the final day, we will experience that holy garden once again. No, and to experience face to face, to be able to walk right up to Jesus and give him a hug and say, thank you for, for your sacrifice. Or to see our loved ones and to be with them together again and to experience the blessing of that. To know the the pleasures that are forevermore. To know the enduring joy of eternity. To experience that every single day. I don't don't need a happiness project. It's going to be the happiness lifestyle. Right? And that's coming. And that's the blessed hope that we have. That one day our Savior is coming back and, and that day it will come. And we will see fully. And the pure in heart will see God today by faith and tomorrow face to face. That's what our hearts are longing for, right? <laughs> you know, it was in 2001 that, um, that Bart Millard of Mercy Me wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine. Anybody remember that song? You're like, who doesn't? You can't be a Christian without knowing that song, right? You can be a Christian without knowing that song. It's not in the Bible, but... Seriously, it, it's that popular because we all know it, right? Because it resonated with our hearts. In 2001, he said he wrote that song in 10 minutes. He said, I've never had that experience before, and the song just flowed out, and he said, how it is is how it was written. He's like, it was the easiest song I ever had to write. And he spoke of the glories of, of what it would be like to see the Lord, what it would be like to be with our Savior, what it would be like In 2001, the song went to number one on the charts, and it remained there. Over the years, it became platinum five times over, selling over two and a half million copies. And then wouldn't you know they'd release a movie, and so they re-released the song again in 2018, and it went to number one again. (laughs) Now, why does that happen, friends? Because our hearts long to see God. Because our hearts long to be with him. I'll tell you, for 10 years as a pastor, I I couldn't do a funeral without hearing, I can only imagine. (laughs) It was like the refrain that was going on at every funeral. Why? Because that was our heart's call and our heart's cry. Oh, to see God. Oh, to see God. How does that happen? Jesus says it comes to the pure in heart. I don't know about you, friends, but it makes me say, how do I get there? How do I get there? How do I get pure in heart? How do I experience that purity of heart? First, I would encourage you, friends, trust Christ. Trust Christ. How do you become pure in heart? Remember, it is an internal conversion that is necessary because you can't transform something that is dead. You can't enliven a dead heart that, that, that longs for the flesh and longs for sin. You need a new heart. You need a converted heart. And that's why Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That is the gospel's effect. That God came in the form of Jesus. Jesus came to earth, gave his life for us so that he could show us the mercy we deserved as we learned and spoke of last week. But also uh, so that he would purify us. He would cleanse us from all the, the lawlessness, redeeming us from our sinfulness and purifying our hearts from the inside out. And uh, purifying for himself a people for his own possession. You need this work of God in your life. You cannot just try and fix yourself with some self-help material that's going to fix a little bit for a moment. You need a work of the Spirit in your life. And so you've got to turn to Jesus. That's the point of the cross. That's the reason for the cross. So that you could experience this purity of heart that was never possible apart from the Lord. The scripture says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Have you ever tried to clean yourself up, clean your hands off when they're just filthy and dirty? With nothing else coming from without, there's no way you're going to get those hands completely clean unless you have the agent from the outside coming and washing and purifying. And that's what you need from the Lord. So trust in Christ. Trust in the grace of God that has appeared. Trust that work that redeems us from all lawlessness and purifies us for himself. Turn to Christ. I remember in high school, um, before I was, uh, you know, just uh, smitten and taken uh, by the bride of my my youth, uh, Kathy, Um, in high school, um, I had recently, uh, you know, uh, returned to the Lord and and rededicated my life to the Lord. And... um, I remember, uh, remember being in class, and in and, and one of my classes, there was this girl. And to be honest, I forget her name, and that's probably important that I forget her name now. But <laughs> Very important that I forget her name. <laughs> but I remember in that time having a different attraction to a girl than I'd known. I was attracted to her character. I was attracted to her spirit. She was so kind. She was so nice. And I, I remember thinking to myself as, a, as, as somebody who had the newness of faith and the newness and the freshness of walking with Jesus and going, wow, Lord, I, I can't believe that this girl doesn't know you. She seems so nice, so kind. Like if anyone looks like a Christian, she looks like a Christian. And yet, in my naivety, the Lord instructed me and, uh, and taught me about the reality of every human heart. I said, hey, Mike, remember your heart that led you into that rebellious season of your life where your sinfulness was very evident? That sinfulness is there for all of us. And no matter how nice she was, no matter how kind she was, the reality is, is that her heart is still corrupted with sin and broken and desperately in need of a cleansing and washing that only comes through the cross and the blood of Jesus. Even the best of us, friends, needs a new heart, needs a converted heart. So trust Christ. How do we become pure in heart? Start by trusting Christ. Let him give you a purity you can never have. But then also go on to confessing your sins. This, this, friends, should be the regular experience of the follower of Jesus. The confession of sin over and over. Think of it this way. We are one time saved, but there are many cleansings. One time saved, many cleansings. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 says this. Starting in verse 5, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
If, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And friends, what, what John is, the Apostle John is speaking about is the fellowship with the Lord, right? He's not speaking of salvation, whether when we sin, we're outside of the uh, salvation of God, and when we, when we walk rightly, then we're in the salvation of God. No, 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 we are saved, but there's this reality of when that sanctified person, that changed heart person, begins to walk into sin again, they need a cleansing from that unrighteousness. And if you have that sense in your life of farness from God, and where is God, and I, man, I used to be able to hear his voice, but now I can't, or I don't know the nearness of God in my life, and you're wondering, where did God go, and what was his problem, and why would he do this? More often than not, friends, it is not God who has moved, but it is you. And friends, the reality is, is you need a cleansing. And, and so rather than, rather than you know, walking in darkness and calling it light, or rather than walking in darkness and, and self-deceiving yourself to say, you know what, this really isn't that bad, or this is just, you know, this is just, you know, the way I'm looking at this, or this is really who I am, and if I was only, you know, accepted for who I am, th then they would know that it's really okay. No, no, no. Rather than, rather than deceiving ourselves in that way, rather come into the light. And as the follower of Jesus, when, when you walk in sin, just bring that to the Lord. Just confess that. And friends, I encourage you often, if this is not part of your quiet times with the Lord, make it part of the quiet time to come to the Lord and just say, Father, is there, any, is there anything in my life that is hurtful? Is there, if, is there anything in my life that is keeping me from seeing you clearly or, or, or hearing from you more intimately or, 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 or sensing your nearness? Is there anything in my life that has offended you is there any way that I have not loved you with all that I am or have not loved my neighbor as myself? And, and, and friends, if you open your heart honestly to the Lord, you better get a long pad of paper because <laughs> he might write some stuff down for you. And he might say, hey, remember that conversation you had with your brother the other day? Hey, hey remember the way you were behaving at work? Hey, remember the things that you were looking on the internet late at night? Hey, remember the way in which you stole from that person? Remember the way your eyes wandered after the things that your, your, your neighbor had that you had to have, and so you spent more than you had to go get what you think you had to have? When he brings those things up, friends, he's not bringing them up to heap condemnation, but rather so that you can be cleansed. So don't run from that work of God, but rather bring those things forth. Bring those things forth in confession. Confess those things. Say the same thing. Don't call it a, you know, don't call it something else. Just say what God says about it. Lord, that's sin. That is a covetous spirit. That is an adulterous heart. That is a lying tongue. That is a greedy, or, 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 or just call it sin and confess it. In fact, the, the word that is spoken here, it, it, the word for purity it is uh, katharos. Katharos. It, confession is literally catharsis for the soul. It is cathartic in the sense that it is cleansing. And, and, it, and it gets what is inside, the evil inside, and it releases it from within. And so that's why in James 5, 16, we're told to confess our sins to one another. So find a brother, find a sister, find somebody who is, who is, who is, who is mostly grace and truth in their relationships, and, and, and they will be somebody that you can confess your sins to, and you can say, hey, can I, just, can I just tell you the ugly? Can I just speak that out? Can I just get that out right now? And you not judge me, but you help restore me through the gospel to Jesus? Find somebody like that in your life. I mean, we, we try to cultivate that in our grace groups for that kind of catharsis, that kind of confession of soul, to be able to confess those sins to one another. Or friends, if, 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 you, can't, if you can't find a godly person in your life, come on in, talk to the pastors. We would love to be that source for you. Trust Christ, confess your sins, and bring it into the light. Also take out the trash. Just take out the trash. 
James chapter 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Friends, take out the trash. Stop lying. Just stop lying. Find somebody in your life that you can stop lying and telling yourself a reality that makes your heart feel better. Rather, embrace the truth. Learn to love and value the truth. I'm telling you, you want to experience the blessed life and the happiness of life? You are never going to experience that when you're lying to yourself or you're lying to others. So if you have a deceitful heart or a deceptive spirit, if you like to hide it and close it, now don't excuse it because you're like, well, I'm very comfortable in the grace. No, you're very comfortable with sin. Stop lying. Friends, stop falling into lust. That, that's a major part for us, especially for guys, but also for women. The lust of our hearts, the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, the moral purity that we need, the sexual purity. Take out the trash. Friends, if the internet is, is causing you to stumble, lock it up. Get a software for it. Get an accountability partner. Find somebody that you confess your sin every time. Somebody that's going to pray for you, somebody that's going to support you, somebody that's going to encourage you, but somebody that is not going to enable you. Find it. If you have to tear the TV off the wall and throw it away, do it. If you have to close the subscription tomorrow, it's too late today. Friends, take out the trash. Stop the lying. Stop the, the lusting. Stop the vices. Whatever keeps your heart from the Lord, any, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be the big ones that we always think of. Maybe it's the little things. Maybe for you, you're, you're like, it's the chocolate cake that's on the counter. I always got to replace it, right? Once the Portillo's chocolate cake is gone to the end, I got to go get another one. And it's always there and it's calling me. And, and that's the th idol of your heart that keeps you away from Jesus and hungering for the truths of him. Get, just take out the trash. Take out the trash. And then lastly, go for the good. Go for the good. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 says this, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Friends, the pure in heart are going after the good. Because see, you cannot just leave a vacuum of spirit. When you have taken out the trash, you have to replace it with something that's good. And you have to retrain your heart through that to hunger after the things of God. The pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In 1879, there was an amazing invention that came on the market. It was ivory soap. Remember ivory soap? Some of you are like, I still use it. Because it was, it was said to be 99.44% pure. Some of the purest stuff around. It was so pure, in fact, that its first slogan was, it's so pure, it floats. It floats in water, right? Ivory soap. You want to clean yourself up? Get yourself some ivory. That's what they would say. You know what Jesus says? Ivory soap's not going to help you. <laughs> Your problem is way, way more than just some soap or just an outside cleansing or just rearranging a couple things in your schedule or a couple things in your life. What you need is a total transformation from Jesus. So come to him. Let him change and transform your heart. Confess that sin. Get that out. Get rid of the garbage and embrace the good. Let's pray about that today.